So, hi everybody, and thanks for uh, sticking around to the last talk of the conference. Um, just briefly, I'm going to give you a quick introduction by myself. Uh, as you might have noticed already, I am uh, French. Um, <laughs> Uh, and so I apologize for the accent, but mostly for my semi-broken voice. I hope it, it stands up and you can understand me. Um, so I'm a full stack kind of guy. I do, this day I do mostly backend work with Django, obviously. Uh, I also like to dabble with front-end development and uh, interaction design when I get the chance. Uh, I've worked with Django since 2007 and submitted patches uh, a lot to the admin in particular, and uh, became a core developer last year. And I tweet and stuff from uh, this uh, handle, if you like what I say. And so although I'm French, I've lived in Australia for several years, and about six months ago, I relocated to San Francisco. And I'm now working for Odepod. It's, uh, it's an awesome uh, digital agency, and you should check us out. So let's dive right in. I've worked in, in Teams for several years now on Django project. And there, there's been a lot of things that have improved uh, the life of developers during the, the last couple of years, is especially with things like DVCS, like Git in particular, and uh, things like virtual land. But at the same time, uh, the web stack has become a lot more complex over time now to provide any of the features that are expected from any website these days, you, you really have to, to, to use all the components for like RabbitMQ, Solar, or Redis, just to cite a few. So maybe because of that, um, I consistently hit the same issues over and over. In particular, two problems. The first one is about onboarding other developers. This is, it tends to always be hard and time consuming, especially if the person that you, you're trying to onboard doesn't have a lot of experience. Maybe it's a, it's a front-end developer that doesn't know about Django or a designer, and, or they've never, they've never worked with the, with the, in your project before. And so if you're lucky enough, you would have a very long wiki page that, that states, and that's up to date, and that states all of the steps to, 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 to go through to install all of the requirements for your project. And this is just time consuming, boring, and nobody wants to do that, right? Another set of issues is about the inconsistencies that exist between the different team members' platforms uh, and also the, de the development platform in general and the production platform. One example is, uh, and that happened to me in the past, uh, is that one of the team members committed some code uh, on the Django project using some features that, that were only available in Python 2.7. And, and, and they did that on a project that relied on Python 2.6. So obviously, when the other team members pulled the code, everything broke. And this is just an example, but this tends to happen a lot. And I hope that these two types of issues is something that you relate to, uh, because this is really what I'm going to try and tackle in this talk and try and find solutions for. So first of all, I'm gonna, uh, I'd like to understand why. Why uh, I, and hopefully a lot of you, uh, consistently hit those issues. So I have a question for you. Um, who in the audience uses a Mac as their primary development platform? All right, seems like the overwhelming majority. And how many of you use uh, Linux? Yeah, quite a few, it's like maybe 40%. And how many of you use Windows? <laughs> okay, this, all right, that's about five. And so that sort of seems to match these made up statistics uh, that I've <laughs> floated. <laughs> um, now I have another question for you. Um, how many of you in this room use uh, a Windows Microsoft server to serve their website in production? There's one. I didn't expect that. Yeah. <laughs> and how many use a Mac server to serve the production side? None, okay. 
Good. This is good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope you see that this is crazy, right? I just wanted to make this, uh, this statement. This is crazy. All of us pretty much use uh, Linux or maybe Solaris type of box in production, and we use different tools in development. Another question. Have any of you here tried to install, say, MySQL or Postgres on a Mac or Windows before? Right, good. Uh, how many of you have ever even just once messed up there Develop an environment, maybe you've, you've installed the wrong version of a software, or you've deleted some configuration files and everything broke, and then you took, it took hours to fix it. Okay, most of us. Well, if, if you, the answer is yes to any of those questions, and you're like me, then you probably felt a bit like this. <laughs> <laughs> so if you try to recap um, the things that make for a bad experience, a bad developer experience, First of all, installing a web stack on Windows or Mac is insane. Stop doing this to yourself. You deserve better. Installing a web stack on, on a Linux box is way, way, way easier in general. And this is what you use in production, so okay, stop doing that. And then, if you keep using the same development platform over, over time for many projects, it tends to accumulate a lot of craft Maybe you abandon some projects, and there's a ton of stuff that just lies there, and you even forget about it. And, and then it just, it just makes your whole system more brittle and just waiting to bite you one day when you least expect it. And then, generally, most developers uh, tend to dislike installing and configuring software, and they'd rather spend time actually doing stuff, right? Uh, writing code and building features. So how do we do about, how do we go about solving this? Imagine an ideal world where all developers in your team worked on the same pre-built platform. Nobody has to install anything, it's just there, it's ready to go. And the same world where the development and production uh, platform uh, closely match, have the same spec. So there's no surprise when you push code live, it just, it, you know it's gonna work. Well, this world already exists and it's called virtualization. For those of you who are not completely familiar with the term, is, this is uh, what allows you to run, for example, Windows on a Mac. It's just, it's all, it's all virtual, virtual because it's all software. You don't need to have a uh, Windows laptop. You can just run the Windows OS on a Mac. And virtualization has been around for ages. It's nothing new, but something that's been made a lot easier in the last couple of years, uh, is that it's been a lot easier for developers to manipulate those, those uh, virtual machines. And in particular, it's, it's thanks to one project in particular, which is called Vagrant. Uh, a few weeks ago, I, I was just chatting with Mitchell Hashimoto, the creator of Vagrant on RRC, and I, I just asked him, uh, why is it called Vagrant? And this, this is what he said. Um, the idea was that developers are working in these transient boxes that are portable, move around, etc. No permanent residence, like a vagrant. And hopefully this is gonna make sense once I explain to you how, how vagrant works. Uh, by the way, the guy there on screen is the logo of vagrant and I have some stickers, so if you're interested, come and see me afterwards. So what is vagrant? In, in, in my view, Vagrant is basically a developer-friendly interface for VirtualBox. VirtualBox is a, is a free tool that allows you to manipulate and create virtual machines. Currently, Vagrant only supports VirtualBox, but in, a, in the near future, there are plans to also support VMware, which you might be more familiar with. And so Vagrant a, a, appears to be something pretty simple and small. Uh, but that's because it is actually very easy to use. So it's, it's almost transparent to the developer. But behind the scene, it does a lot of uh, really robust stuff so that you don't have to deal with the, with the difficult side of uh, managing virtual machines. So in a nutshell, the workflow of Vagrant for one given developer is that the developer is going to uh, interact with Vagrant by running some very simple commands and the, the main one is Vagrant Up, which basically uh, just boots 
boots up uh, a virtual machine. It's basically the same as pressing the on button on a, on a physical computer. And the developer also has to provide a configuration file, which is called Vagrant file, which contains some very simple and basic instructions about what the, the, the virtual machine should contain. Then Vagrant is going to talk to VirtualBox to create um, the, the virtual machine. And then the second step is that Vagrant is also going to, to talk to some provisioners which are responsible for provisioning the virtual machine, which means they are responsible for installing and configuring all of the software that you need for running your, your project. And so once the virtual machine has been created, booted, and uh, provisioned, then you as a developer can access it directly, for example, via SSH. Uh, so if you imagine, you, in the same way as you would uh, access a remote server, you would just access the, this virtual machine. The only difference is that it just sits right there inside your, your host machine locally. Just a quick word about provisioners. I've listed here probably the, the most uh, popular ones uh, these days. There is Chef and Puppet, which are Ruby-based projects. And there is SoulStack, which is a more recent project, which I believe is written in Python. And then there's the good old shell. If, if you are familiar with writing uh, shell script, you, you feel right at home uh, using Vagrant. Uh, the, what the, the three uh, projects on the left do is that they, instead of letting you write all of the shell script, they are going to abstract out a lot of the logic so that then you don't have to worry about uh, certain implementation details. And those, those basically act as framework for provisioning virtual machines. So just to give you an idea, I'm going to give you some very small examples about Chef. So this is, for example, how you would install a package, a system package with Chef. You would just basically uh, state the name of the package and then action install. And this same script would run on any platform. It would run on AWS or on Ubuntu machine or Solaris or whatever. Uh, Chef is going to figure out which package manager to use, where to install stuff. You don't have to worry about that. Another example is uh, using Apache. It's pretty easy to set up a new Apache site. Uh, you, you, know, you state a few very basic um, parameters. You can even provide a template for your Apache configuration. Uh, which may contain some variables if you want to um, uh, uh, have maybe multiple configuration files for multiple websites that would share the same, the same directives. So I, I've, I've, uh, I've listed so those provisioners. Personally, I've, I'm, I've been using Chef mostly, but purely because it's just done the job for me. I know that it's, it really comes down to personal taste. Other people prefer Puppet or SoulStack. I really encourage you to check them all out if you're not familiar, and then just pick the one that feels right to you. And then, so the Vagrant file, as I stated before, is the one Vagrant configuration file. And this is what glues everything together. It contains some very basic inst instructions. For example, what uh, virtual machine it should be based on. So in, for example, Ubuntu or Solaris. Uh, it will also list the shared folders between the host machine and the virtual machine. This is very important. In particular, you're always going to want to share the folder that contain your project code. And that will allow you to edit the code in your host machine with your regular editor. And the, the virtual machine is going to have access to the exact same files. And it will serve them uh, and will just do the hard work inside the box. And it will also just list uh, all the provisioning script that you want to run to build the, the virtual machine. So just to sum up, what, what would the workflow become if you adopted Vagrant today? First, everybody in your team would have to install Vagrant and VirtualBox. This is very easy. They have like one-click installs, both of the, those projects. And it works on Windows, Linux, and Mac, so really anyone in your team should be able to get set up very quickly. And this is something you only need to do once. Then 
Everybody in your team need, would need to clone the, the, your project's code repository if that's not already the case. You just need to make sure that, that the Vagrant file and the provisioning script are checked in that repository. And even if there's really just one person that, should be res that could be responsible for writing you know, the Vagrant file and the provisioning scripts, but then everybody else in the team, no matter how many people are in your team, the only thing that they will have to do is to run just one command they will have to run Vagrant up. And that's going to read the Vagrant file and the, pro and the provisioning script. And you, you would just have to wait a few minutes, depends on how complex your, your provisioning scripts are. But basically, it's going to automatically create your virtual machine with everything ready to go. And it, it's, it, it is reproducible. It's a reproducible virtual machine, which means that if, for example, you mess up, uh, like you delete some important configuration file or you, 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 you break some software inside a virtual machine, most of the time you don't want to bother trying to fix it. You know, the, the quick, the quick easy, and easy way is to just destroy the box and you just pin up a new one. And then you will, have, you will start again fresh from a, a pristine environment and ready to go again. And then, yeah, again, you, you, you just continue to write code as you always have with your favorite editor or IDE, and you continue, and the, the virtual machine is gonna serve the website, so do the actual hard work. And you will just continue to use your favorite browser as you always have. So that's it for the theory. Uh, to illustrate how this all works, uh, I've, I've prepared a couple of examples. The first one is, uh, DjangoProject.com. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you again, uh, how many of you here have tried to, to pull the code for, for DjangoProject.com, maybe trying to run it locally if you wanted to uh, provide some bug fixes or features? Right, a few of you. Uh, if you have or if you want to do it right now, uh, it would take you maybe two or three hours trying to figure out how the project is laid out the kind of requirements you need to install, and it's really a hit and miss, you know, you go step by step and you figure it all out. But it takes time and it's pretty boring, and it's only like after three hours that you're ready to, you know, to, to start writing code. So how will we go about creating a virtual machine for this? So this is a Django project. Uh, it has some pretty basic requirements, but it also has some, some things that are a bit specific and different. So for everything that's pretty typical, you, you would want to create a virtual lamp. You would want to create, uh, create all the Django settings files. You want to install a database server and create a database and perhaps also load some initial data. And you would want to install and configure a web server. Now, what makes DjangoProject.com uh, different? Uh, from most websites is that it's, it's actually not just one website, but it's, it's two websites. One website is the, the one, it's like the homepage plus you know, a number of flat pages. And then there's also the documentation website, which sits in a different subdomain and it's powered by actually a separate instance, a separate Django instance. And um, before we can serve the documentation, we also have to build the Sphinx documentation. So we have to process all the Sphinx files to generate all of the HTML that's gonna be um, served uh, on docs.djangoproject.com. Actually, I lie, there's also a third website, which is Track, uh, the issue tracking system. Uh, it's a beast of its own, and just don't have time to cover it here. But uh, here we have a, a setup that's you no know, challenging enough and interesting enough to, to, to do something about. Now I'm going to show you some code snippets for the provisioning script. I'm intentionally going to go through them very fast because it's not really interesting, it's just a bunch of you know, uh, shell scripts. Uh, the, my intention is not to teach you how to write the script, it's just to give you an idea of the kinds of things you, will, you, you could do. And you can always refer back to my slides when I publish them or just check out the, uh, the repository here. Okay, so we start with the Vagrant file, which is you know, the one Vagrant configuration file. As you see, it's pretty basic. Uh, you, you just provide the, the type of the, like the base box that you wanna use. In this case, it's a Lucid32. 
it's basically an Ubuntu 10.04 10, 10 LTS box. Uh, then you can assign it uh, an IP address. It's completely arbitrary. In this case, just chose 2345. This is what's going to allow you to access the virtual machine from, from the host machine. And then I, I create a shared folder. <clears throat> so what's, what's going to happen there is that it's basically the source code of the project. So I've, I've checked out the djangoproject.com uh, source code from GitHub. And I'm just going to match this folder on my host machine with a folder inside the virtual machine so that the code is going to be shared between the two. And then I'm going to list all of the uh, provisioning scripts that I want to use and to create uh, the box and install all the required software. In this case, um, uh, there is Python. Uh, sorry, there's, yeah. Uh, the, the Lucid32 box already contains Python 2.6, so that's convenient. But then I want to install pip, virtualenv, Apache 2, uh, git, memcache, and Postgres. And this is really all you have to do to install this stuff. Because in this case, I'm using some recipes, uh, which has basically a set of provisioning scripts. And those are just available on the Chef website. And they're pretty robust. They, they work on pretty much any platform, and there's very nearly nothing you have to do to, to, to configure to get them running. It's pretty simple. So you just have to download them, stick them into your repository, list them in the Vergon file, and you're ready to go. The one thing that's a bit different is the one at the bottom. It's my, my recipe, the one that I wrote to install everything that's specific about this particular project. So now I'm going to show you some of the, the script that I wrote as part of that recipe to install everything that I need to run this project. So first, I create a virtual env, which is based on Python 2.6. Um, the only thing interesting here is that I'm going to load, already preload the requirements, which are currently stored in, in those two files, uh, deploy requirements.txt and local requirements.txt. Then I'm going to create a database. Uh, so I created a user, create a database, and also uh, load some initial data, which is sitting in the repository. Then I will build the Sphinx docs, first by getting a fresh clone, a fresh Django clone, so that I get the latest uh, documentation file. And then I will CD into that folder and then run the script that's going to build the docs. Then I'll create two settings files, because we have two websites. Those two settings files are very similar. There are just a couple of things that change between them. So that's why I use a template which, you know, a couple of variables that allows to, uh, to change the, the, the couple of bits that are a bit different. Similarly, I will create two WSGI files as the point of entry from, for Apache to serve those two websites. And again, th those are very similar. So again, I create a template with a variable to change this, which sending file I'm going to serve. And finally, I'm going to configure Apache. So I create an Apache uh, configuration, which is based off this template. And this template contains the directives to uh, configure the two websites. So on this first page, it's to configure the, the, the main website. So I, I set up the, the media files for the admin, and then the media files for the front end site. And then I reference the WSGI file. And similarly, the second, second page of that file is uh, to set up another virtual host to serve the documentation site. And that, that site is going to listen on port 8080, whereas the main site is going to ser, uh, listen on port 80. And that's about it, really. Um, I'm going to give you a quick demo now. OK. So here I am on, in the terminal, inside the terminal on my host machine. So I'm still you know, in Mac land. I'm going to run the command vagrant up. <clears throat> so now it's starting to boot the virtual machine. 
I just need to enter my password so that he can set up the share folder using NFS. And then I just need to wait a little bit. Um, if this was the first time that I was booting the machine, it would also run the provisioning scripts, and that would take about 15 minutes in this case. Here, I've cheated a little bit because I've already created the machine. All I'm doing here is to just boot it. So I'm just booting it for the second time. So it should take a lot less time, you know, j just a few seconds. And all of this green stuff that you, can, that you see here is basically all the output from the provisioning script. So all of that stuff, would, you know, it would take about 15 minutes to, to display. You know, I'm downloading Apache. I'm installing Apache. I'm downloading post Postgres. I'm installing Postgres. But now it's, you know, it's very fast because it's already done. So it's basically going to skip all those steps every subsequent time you, you boot up the machine. So if everything worked, um, If I go to 2.3.4.5 on port 80, or I actually don't need to, to say that, then we have the website. So basically, all I had to do, Vagrant up, and then I open the browser, and the site is running. The database is set up. All the web pages, all the pages are there. And if I go to port 8080, now I see the docs. So absolutely zero effort. The only effort basically has been on me uh, previously uh, for writing all of those scripts. But then everybody else who would like to contribute to jungleproject.com could basically just uh, download the repository and then get going. And oh, and another quick thing. So. What I'm showing you here is, is served by the Apache instance that's sitting inside the virtual machine. But if you, if you like using the Django run server command, you can still do that. Um, so, oh, another thing you can do also is you can SSH into the box. Right, so now I am inside the box. Uh, if you can see, I don't know if you can see. Uh, so right here, the the virtual env is, is is already activated, so that you know that's one less thing you have to do. That's also part of the provisioning script. I just said uh, activate the virtual env every time you SSH into the box. So that's one less thing you need to worry about when you're using the virtual machine. And then you also already inside the the the, the project with all the, the source the source code. And then I can run, you know, uh, manager py. Say I'm going to give it um, uh, to serve it on port 8000, and I'm going to serve the main website, which is using the local setting style. <coughs> oh yeah, forgot run server. Right. So if I go to port 8000, now well, I'm, it's just using the, the it's serving the, the, the main website, but this time via the Django um, development server. OK, so that, that was one example. Another example uh, that I've prepared for this talk is to run the Django test suite. So I have a question for you here. Again, I ask a lot, a lot of questions today. Um, who in this room have ever run the Django core test suite using SQLite? Yeah, it's good. It's about 20, 25. And so keep, keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Uh, how many of you have also run it using MySQL or Postgres? That's a good number. It's good, good, good. And how many of you have ever run a Geo Django test? I'm impressed. It's maybe s nearly 10. Yeah, that's great. Uh, if you ever try to run, you, you can 
uh, <laughs> that's enough. No more question. No more question. Uh, if you've tr ever tried to run a Geo Django test, whether you failed or even succeeded, I'm pretty sure you were feeling like this again. Okay. Uh, and it's not. It's not really a surprise. Uh, Geo Django is an awesome piece of software, and I really would recommend anyone to try it out. It's pretty awesome. But it's also very complex. And this is because you have to download about half of the internet. <laughs> and then you have to compile it and uh, in the right order with the right configuration. This is very painful. So really, you, you, you don't want to do that. You want to let somebody else do that. And in fact, I did it. Um, so I've, I've created this project. It's on GitHub. It's called the Django Core Box. So it's basically. Basically, one Vagrant file and a set of provisioning scripts, which uh, will install for you uh, every version of Python that's currently supported by Django, every supported d database backend, so SQLite, Specialite, MySQL, PostgreSQL, PostGIS, and hopefully soon Oracle as well. It also installs all of the dependencies for GeoDjango. If you were to, to build to use those scripts to build the, the, the VM from scratch, it would, take, uh, it would take about one hour if you have a fast internet connection. If you want to save the compilation time, you can also download a pre-built uh, virtual machine, which, which takes about 1.1 gigabyte. Um, and so here's another demo. So here, here's how it works. So I believe I've already, <clears throat> yeah. So I, I've already booted that machine, and so now I've just SSH into that machine. So if you are at this stage, you've basically only done Vagrant up. That's all you've done so far, and then you do Vagrant SSH to to get into it. And it, the Vagrant up stage would take about it would take about thirty seconds if you're building off the the pre-built box. Or it would take about an hour if you actually let all the scripts run and install and configure. Right, so now I'm inside the box. What I've also done is to create a few aliases to run uh, the tests, uh, just to make it quicker. So for example, there is this alias uh, run test. If you want to run the tests on Python 2.6, for example, using Specialite, uh, we're going to run the GeoDjango test. There you go. The tests have run. They failed, but they run. So we have to fix Django. <laughs> but we, we were able to run the test, which is if you ever try to install the, 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 Django, uh, the Geo Django test suite, you, I'm sure you would feel uh, the relief there. Um, let's run another, another example. So if you want to run uh, the test for Python 2.7 using Postgres, for, um, uh, I don't know, the Oath app, for example. So yeah, it's running. It's running because every database backend is already installed. There's already a database. There are all the dependencies already, already installed. You just have to run the test, and, and that's it. And obviously, you can it also edit the Django code because the Django code itself is shared with your host machine. So from your host machine, you can you know, use your editor, you change the, the Django code, you write your test, then you go into the VM and you run the test. Right, and that's about it. The, um, I, so I, I brought, I brought a, a flash drive because I think if we all start downloading this 1.1 gigabyte uh, virtual machine, we're going to wreck the, the Wi-Fi. Uh, so I, I've downloaded the, uh, I already have it in flat drive. So if you're interested to try it out, and I recommend it, if you stick around for the, the sprint, come and see me, and I'll give you everything you need to get ready instantly on your, on your laptop. Um, and just quickly in closing, so 
I, I, I just want to make it sound like everything is all perfect about Vagrant. There are some overheads, in particular, memory usage, because you have to keep in mind that running a virtual machine, you're basically running an entire operating system, and another operating system inside your operating system. So, so there definitely is some uh, memory usage overhead there. But it's, it's, it's OK. I mean, these days, laptops have a lot of memory. If you have more than two gigs, you're probably OK to, to do that. And also, at least one person in your team is going to have to run, to learn uh, provisioner. Uh, if you're good with shell script, you're, you're, you're fine. Uh, but if you want to go you know, uh, one step further, you might want to launch Chef or Puppet. But it's also not that hard. Uh, but that's, that's basically the, all, the only overhead. Any, uh, anyone else in the team, they don't have to learn anything at all. So yeah, that's why I believe the benefits of using Vagrant largely compensate the, those overheads. Because that, this model scales really well. Uh, in my team, for example, it, uh, I, I've set up all the scripts, uh, all the provisioning scripts, and then every time someone new comes in, they have nothing to learn. Nothing to learn, they get ready in, in about half an hour. They've never used Django, it doesn't matter. In half an hour, they're ready to, to start working on the website. Um, and, it, and you can add you know, any number of members to your team. This is not going to change anything. So yeah, Vagrant is awesome, and you should try it out. That's it, thank you. When you are running a, on, on a team, on a project, there is like this regular update and uh, people pull the code and uh, if they are not Django developers, they need to sync DB, migrate, and do all this kind of thing. Is it also, do you include them into the background file, so every time they background up, it will pull and uh, sync DB and migrate, or is it something that they need to? It's all up to you, really. Uh, if, if you would like that to be, you just need to write a, a script, which is going to be run every time you boot up the machine, and it's going to do the job for you. It really depends on your needs, but you could definitely do that, yes. Just sort of an answer to that question. Um, you can SSH in and do whatever you want directly as well, um, or ship new base boxes occasionally. Um, one other thing is uh, right now VirtualBox is, or sorry, Vagrant is requiring VirtualBox. Uh, I know that Mitchell's working on uh, VMware support. Uh, do you have any idea of timeline on that? Uh, so uh, I had a chat with, with uh, Mitchell. The, um, the, the creator of Vagrant a few weeks ago about that. Um, so just recently, they've just broken dependency on Vagrant Box, oh, I'm sorry, on VirtualBox. Uh, so now the, the Vagrant code is not reliant anymore on, on VirtualBox. But still, VirtualBox is the only supported, by, uh, only supported uh, virtual machine manager. Uh, as for a timeline for VMware, uh, there, uh, you know, it, there are no definite, definite timeline, but why, from what I understood, it would be if it's a few months away, basically. Uh, so yeah, about a, a year ago, um, my team started moving towards this Vagrant VirtualBox puppet combination uh, for exactly the reasons that you mentioned. Um, but we've since backed off it a little bit um, for the simple reason that we've, we found there have been some real stability issues with it. Um, some of it was things that were just incompatible versions of VirtualBox and Vagrant, which can be fixed. Um, but a lot of times we would have issues where just Vagrant would seem to lose communication with the VM for no reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, it was a problem for some developers uh, and not for others. Most of us are on uh, OS X. Um, but it would, be, it would just be very difficult things to resolve. Sometimes upgrading VirtualBox would help. Sometimes it didn't. Um, but there were a lot of, like, and we spent many hours sometimes fixing the issues and sometimes not. Um, but I, I just wonder, I guess, ha have you en encountered any of this? I kind of chalk it up to, to VirtualBox, most likely. Uh, and if so, do you have any advice for fixing it? When, when did you stop using it? Um, well, we're still using it on some projects. Uh, okay. it, it was definitely an issue about a year ago, so it may be that things have gotten yeah. better. But it and are you, still, are you still experiencing those issues? Um, I haven't worked on a project that used it. Okay. The last couple we've done, we kind of actually did, dropped it for that yeah. reason. Um, I started using it about six months ago, and it was shortly after they cut the 1.0 release. 
So I know they, they, they cut the 1.0 because they were really confident about uh, the stability of the API, at least, and I presume the stability of the system itself. So I, I personally haven't really hit any, any of those issues. I know that VirtualBox has a lot of quirks, and it sometimes it needs quite a bit more memory than it should, and it's sometimes it's been unstable, but so far it's been okay. I haven't had that kind of issues. Thanks for introducing me to Vagrant. I hadn't heard of it before, and I'm excited. But my favorite provisioner is not on the supported list, Fabric. Um, my question is, if, since it has the command line support, have you heard anything about how easy or painful it is to drop back to that to use a different provisioner yep. like Fabric? You, you can use Fabric. Uh, so th there is built-in support for Chef and Puppet. But you can also use salt. Uh, that there's a project on the GitHub, I think it's salty-vagrant, uh, which would give you the same kind of, the same kind of built-in support for salt. Um, if you want to run Fabric, you, you can. You, know, you just need to install Fabric, and you, you're ready to go. Uh, now, if you have Fabric installed on your host machine, you can access your VM just as you would access any remote machine. So you can make, you know, you can write fabric scripts that are going to run scripts inside your VM, just in the same way as you do it on AWS on, or whatever. So the built-in provisioners are just, you don't have to install an additional y yes. dependency? Yes, that's oh. pretty much it. And there, there's a, so Chef and Puppet are pre-installed in the, in the base boxes that are provided by Vagrant. Mm -hmm. that's, that, there's that, and also that in the syntax, in the Vagrant file, there's a few shortcuts that allow you to you know, to define where to find your chef script, things like that. But it's very basic. You, you, you're good to go with Fabric pretty easy also. Great, thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm curious about um, deployment, how deployment works. Um, uh, I guess, in particular, when you have um, a lot of sites that might, that might share the same actual hosting environment, like shared servers or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have any, like, I don't know, experience with something like that or thoughts about, yeah. like, would you recommend deploying actually in a, a, a virtual machine on, you know, the server? No. So, so Vagrant primarily uh, came out as a development tool, mostly, and, and, and still the creator just keeps saying, you know, it is, a, it is a development tool. Uh, now you, you can you can reuse the same uh, provisioning script, say you use a chef script. You can use the same to deploy, I know, and provision, like actual provision, uh, sorry, production servers, if you like. So I guess you can. Uh, the primary benefit of Vagrant is mostly development, and especially in Teams. But nothing prevents you from reusing the same provisioning script that you use to provision your development virtual machine as you would use on a production server. Right. Yeah. Does, yeah. Do, you find, do you find yourself having to create your own virtual box image that uh, Vagrant will fire up? I found when I was trying to use like Ubuntu 11, it didn't have puppet support and 64-bit, and then I had to go build my own Vagrant box that had support wired in it. You know, it's fine, I guess, if you do that once per team. Yeah. But doing that for every project would be a pain. So far, um, I haven't do, done anything too extreme, I guess. Uh, so I've, I've basically just been using that Lucid32 box because it, it might be a bit old, but it's very stable. And everything just tends to work. There's no surprise. I've tried to use more recent boxes, and I had a lot of pain actually installing stuff in, on it or configuring it exactly the way I want it. So, so far, I've been using that box mostly, and it's been working OK. Um, I guess it would really, I, I haven't had the needs to, to, to go any, any further than that. Okay. But I guess you could. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's just answering on the mic. Um, there's a uh, site called uh, vagrantbox.es that's a community contributed list of uh, vagrant based boxes. Yeah. So that's possibly useful place to look. Yeah, one great, just one last point. One great thing about Vagrant is that so you can, 
start off with a very basic uh, box and then provision it every time you run a server. But if you, if, you, if you notice that you always use the same provisioning script across multiple projects, you can package your own box. You just, you know, you just run Vagrant package. That's going to uh, um, package the current box that's currently running into a, a f one file. And then you, can, then you can let everybody in your team, you know, you can make it available, and they, they're going to feed off that box. And everything in there will be pre-installed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.